Uh, thank you very much for joining us this evening. Uh, I can see that we've got 30 people on Zoom and I know that we've got more than 200 people watching on Facebook as well at the moment. So uh, a welcome to everybody this evening. It's great that you've been able to join us. I'd like to welcome you to an online talk this evening by George Kerevan that's hosted by All Under One Banner. My name is Andrew and I help organise with All Under One Banner and I'll be your chair for this evening. Now that everyone is here, I'd like to make three quick points. Uh, we really miss the massive indie family and we look forward to being with every single one of you as soon as it is possible. You are all on our minds. Please take the best of care of yourselves and your clans, especially as this lockdown begins to relax. This is only the second time that we have hosted a talk, whether online or offline. So if there are any technical difficulties, please bear with us, we will persevere. Everyone apart from your speaker tonight and me are muted in the video conference. George will be delighted to answer questions and have a discussion at the end. So if you would like to ask a question, please use the chat function, which you'll see at the bottom of your screen in the Zoom bar. Uh, please type your name and the question which you would like to ask. That way we can manage the questions better and everyone can hear what's going on. Uh, once we manage the questions, we'll come to you, we'll unmute mute you and let you ask your question. I hope that that's clear. I'd also like to make a couple of introductory comments before we really get started. All Under One Banner is all about organising marches on the streets of towns and cities across Scotland in support of Scottish independence. The group never stands still and we've been innovating through 2020. We hosted assembly in February, bringing together groups and individuals from across the independence movement and we hope to host a further assembly sometime in the last quarter of 2020. Please also bear in mind that in the near future, there will be a Peebles Live online Cayley broadcast on Broadcasting Scotland, and that'll be on the night of Saturday the 6th of June. We also have plans for more online talks and discussions on the 12th of June, the 26th of June, and fortnightly thereafter. I'll say a little bit more about those at the end of this evening's talk. Now, I'm sure that all of you will have listened to and have read George's work before, and that's why I was so delighted when he agreed to speak to us this evening. Having said that, you might not recognize him immediately this evening. Both he and I seem to have fallen out with Mr. Gillette during the lockdown. Whether or not you now think he resembles Father Christmas, I'm confident that when he speaks, he will definitely put the red kite amongst the hens. George has been an educator, a writer and author, a broadcaster, and of course a politician. For several years he was deputy editor of The Scotsman, and for two years he was the MP for East Lothian, having secured a remarkable swing of over 20% to the SNP in the general election in 2015. Uh, also, in the interest of full transparency, he has written some very positive words about All Under One Banner. I was standing in a queue in February this year when I read in the National that George was comparing All Under One Banner to the Polish political movement Solidarność. Everyone else in the queue turned round and stared at me when I whooped out loud when I read what he had written. I'll hand over to George now, but remember to write down your question and your name for him using the chat function and we'll go through the questions uh, in the second part of this evening. Uh, and one thing before we get into the guts of the topic, George, uh, I heard you commenting last night with your view of the story of the week, uh, Dominic Cummings and the Westminster government. I was struck by your comments and I wonder, before we talk about other things, whether you would share your thoughts with the folks here this evening. Well, can I begin by saying, um, this is Father Christmas, by the way, uh, or Robinson Crusoe, as I like to think. Uh, it's a great honour to be uh, speaking on the, uh, 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 on the All Under One Banners channel because I sincerely think that without the uh, huge sacrifice and activity of All Under One Banner after the 2016 Brexit referendum, uh, the, uh, the national movement might have died, it might have just have gone to sleep. Uh, and our task of the hour is to revive it when the lockout ends. Um, I've been worried over the last uh, 10 days that a lot of people have reacted to the uh, 
Ferrari around Dominic Cummings to think that, ah, that's it, the Tories are finished. Uh, Johnson's been proven to be an idiot. Uh, Cummings is just lying through his teeth, which of course he is. Uh, they'll soon get rid of him and we'll be back to normal politics. Um, that might happen. Uh, I'm not a great seer as these things go. Uh, but in my guts, in my heart, I don't think we've seen the last of Johnson or Cummings. I'm going to explain why. Because it therefore impacts on uh, how we pursue Indy Ref 2 and how we pursue uh, the national agenda. I uh, had the unfortunate uh, uh, history of having met Mr. Cummings when I was an MP. Uh, we hauled him in to be questioned. And he refused to turn up, just completely arrogant. No, it won't come. And he had to be threatened, actually, with... Um, uh, uh, I, don't, I think possibly we, the Parliament still has the capacity to send people to the Tower of London, but uh, probably been fine or something. But anyway, he, he kicking and screaming, he eventually turned up, having missed many, uh, any original um, uh, uh, dates to talk to the committee. And he was surly, he was um, uninformative, he just exuded arrogance. And we need to take this beyond just the personality type he is. Cummings is not a member of the Conservative Party, he hates the Conservative Party. The chief advisor to the Prime Minister of this country, Tory government, hates the Tory party, thinks it's incompetent, thinks it's old fashioned, thinks he can't get things done, he's right there. He, Cummings, also hates all political parties and all elected MPs. He thinks they're all useless, corrupt and vain. Now, what do you call somebody who hates the entire democratic process, flawed as it is? What do you call a person like that? Dominic Cummings is a fascist. I don't say that to be, you know, just to throw an epithet at him. He is a card-carrying scientific fascist. He hates the entire democratic process. He wants to replace it by government, government by an elite, and particularly government by himself. And government by some charismatic figure, who just happens to be Boris Johnson. Again, I've had many chances to talk to Boris Johnson. He plays this, you know, um, I'm, you know, I'm the daft laddie, uh, I'm charming, you know, who's me, who's with me, you know, I'm, I'm really nice underneath. Once you question him, you question him repeatedly, the facade lifts, and you see this nasty, arrogant, um, uh, really quite vile person underneath. Not a nice person, no real charisma, it's all an act. Now, it could be that the Tories get rid of uh, Johnson because they're worried about the, the public reaction against what Cummings did. It was a huge public reaction, even amongst Tory voters. You can see um, in the north of England where um, uh, 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 the Labour vote had collapsed in um, 20, uh, 2019, um, the, 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 the Labour vote has gone back up again since the Cummings thing happened. Um, but whatever happens, the point is that government in this country, like a lot of other countries, has shifted away from the normal democratic system, flawed as it might be, towards an increasingly authoritarian, I think, um, almost semi-fascist kind of um, populism. Johnson represents that. Johnson might, you know, you might think him as a buffoon. But the first thing Johnson did was to fire to expel from the Tory party a lot of the key um, pro-EU um, pro uh, former leadership of the party. It's very unusual within the Tory party to start expelling people. So what's the damn, what's the damn payment on this? I don't think that Dominic Cummings is going soon. I think he will continue to be the chief advisor with the task of clearing out all the senior civil servants and creating a kind of iron machine for um, Boris to organize government through. I don't think go Boris is going soon. And I think beneath the, 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 the daft laddie facade and the stupid haircut, there's a very nasty personality lurking. I think Britain's British state has gone the same way as um, Trump's America 
as Buenos Aires, uh, Brazil, um, as Urban's uh, Hungary. I think we are seeing a move to an authoritarian right. And if that is correct, then anybody who thinks that we can negotiate a second independence referendum just by sitting around the table, around the table with, with uh, Cummings and, uh, and Johnson, no, no, yeah, you have to respond to the world's column. They are not going to grant us a second referendum. That is the down payment for this week. Um, and, this, and I understand why everyone's really angry. Everyone thinks, well, we, this, they, they've been so stupid and Cummings has been so um, uh, obviously a lot caught as being a liar. Uh, so in the normal process will we'll, we'll, we'll follow through and he have to resign. You've even got, I mean, you've got the Daily Mail and the Daily Telegraph wanting Cummings to go. You think the establishment had turned against him. But we don't. We've, what we're seeing is the erosion of the normal democratic process. So here in Scotland, that tells me not only do we have to get out as fast as possible from this um, uh, sclerotic and declining British state, but if we, we think the way to do that is to negotiate um, in a nice, friendly way across the table with Dominic Cummings and Boris Johnson, then I think um, we are seriously deluded. I think what that tells us is that we have to get back on the street marching. And we have to say, in the end, if we want our freedom, we have to take it, because there is no way that Boris Johnson and Dominic Cummings are going to give it to us. How is that? Thanks, George. I think I think you've made your view uh, very clear, and I, I don't think anybody here would disagree with you in any of that. Uh, the threat that Cummings and uh, and Johnson ch presents, uh, in particular, to Scotland, but to uh, but to the population of the British Isles uh, is is pretty clear at, at the moment. But thank you. That that was just great. Now then, uh, we were we're not here to talk about Cummings this evening, uh, whether we like it or not. Uh, I think there are uh, more important and broader and uh, more forward-looking matters for uh, for us to 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 discuss. So uh, so George, please, uh, we were going to talk about uh, how we how Scotland. Uh, might seek to defend and to uh, organise its economic independence uh, after we have been able to gain political independence. Uh, and I know that everybody here would be delighted to listen to you talking about that this evening. Thank you. Um, well, in a, in a way, the link between Cummings remaining in control and Johnson remaining in control, and what happens when we get, and I hope it's soon, independence. The moment we get constitutional independence, a second struggle is going to open up, a second struggle for economic independence. And I don't think we thought this through um, in enough detail. Um, we may end up like a lot of ex-colonial countries uh, in the last 40 years, uh, running the flag up, feeling we've got an independent government and discovering, sadly, that all the economic power, all the economic levers, all the economic decision making is still somewhere else. And I think that is the danger that Scotland is running and that we will need a second independence struggle after the constitutional freedom is achieved in order to con control our own economy. Now, in that case, we are going to be very different from a lot of the smaller uh, industrial states across the rest of Europe. If you look at uh, Norway, if you look at um, Denmark, if you look at uh, Holland, look at Austria, Switzerland, um, the key economic levers, the key industries are locally owned. And that means that they can set their own economic agenda. Sometimes it's good, sometimes it's bad, but they, they, they have that choice. Uh, almost uniquely, Scotland will, will become independent with most of the serious elements, serious um, uh, industries, structures, banking in the economy owned out with the UK, out with Scotland, and still with the rest of the UK. Now, let me just make a few points about, about the reality of this. Um, if you look at the key, the key sectors of the economy, finance is the most important one because that's where credit comes from, that's where small businesses get their, their, their loans from, that's where you can fund your, your mortgage, um, that's where investment to make the economy grow comes from. Now, post-independence, if nothing changes, then the bulk of the banking and financial sector in Scotland will be owned outside of Scotland, and most of it still down south in the city of London. 
in particular, the biggest bank, and the bank was, was a monopoly practically uh, of much of lending, credit uh, uh, lending, small business lending. Uh, the bank that dominates in Scotland is RBS, Royal Bank of Scotland, because RBS is now entirely an English uh, London-based company. Um, it's created, it's cut itself under several divisions. There's a small Scottish division, which is entirely separate from the rest of the bank, um, which is located in its headquarters um, uh, down south. Um, now, it is true that something over 60% of RBS is still publicly owned uh, by the UK government. Uh, and because of the, the, the medical crisis and because of uh, slowdown in the global economy for the last two years, um, uh, the Johnson government has decided not to go on selling shares in RBS uh, for the time being. So the, there's no instant um, indication that RBS will suddenly become uh, a private company again. Most of it will remain um, with the British government. Now, theoretically, the British government says, well, we don't interfere in day-to-day -day bank activity. Well, that's, uh, that's bollocks, if I can use a scientific phrase. Um, uh, the, the, the Treasury keeps a very close eye on what RBS does. Um, so we run the prospect of, if we get independence within the next 18 months, two years, um, that RBS, our main bank, the key, uh, the key mechanism for providing credit and loans within Scotland, will be not simply London-based and London-owned, but run by the British government. So the minute we have a problem with the British government, you know exactly what Dominic Cummings is going to do. He'll just call in uh, uh, um, uh, Rishi uh, Sunak. Remember, Rishi Sunak got the job as chancellor um, because he was willing to fire all of uh, uh, the special advisors of the last guy and do as he was told, run by, um, uh, run by uh, Cummings himself. So. We need to do, if we were actually thinking about being properly independent, we cannot end up in a situation where the bulk of the banking system is run by RBS from London and ultimately, at, you know, with Dominic Cummings picking up the phone and telling them what to do. That's no form of independence. Uh, so I would say right away that during the negotiation independ uh, negotiations, uh, the independence negotiations, we have to say we want RBS, or at least we want our share of it, and we want the bit that's in Scotland, so that it's entirely Scottish-owned, state-owned, and we can use to rebuild the Scottish economy. That should be a deal-breaker. That's sort of a basic thing that we require. Getting formal uh, political independence and leaving RBS running the economy from London with Dominic Cummings at the end of the phone is no solution whatsoever. Now, I, people will know that I'm, I'm, I wasn't particularly excited by the, um, uh, the Growth Commission report. Andrew Williams is an old friend of mine. We had arguments about it. Um, uh, Andrew wants to keep the pound. If you keep the pound, then your interest rate, your mortgage rate, the exchange rate, uh, all the economic levers are down south. We need our own central bank. And actually, a good central, having a central bank I mean, and our own currency creates all sorts of advantages for the Scottish government. I mean, it means that ultimately we borrow home at home because we can borrow in our own currency. If we don't have our own currency, then we're going to have to borrow from London, City of London, at their, at their interest rates. Um, and if we are own central bank and our own currency, we can control the banks, whoever owns them, because we can set the, uh, uh, the basic regulatory framework. So if you want to run Scotland once we've got independence, you truly want uh, economic independence, you have to have your own currency, and we have to take over the banks <clears throat> and make sure that they're Scottish owned and Scottish run and preferably, uh, from my point of view, um, publicly owned. doesn't mean to say they're all run by the Scottish Government. I I'm a very big fan of, of local cooperative banks, which we used to have in the 19th, early, early 20th century, our old savings bank system, which is very good in Scotland. Um, if you go to other countries, you'll find that um, the savings bank system uh, is the dominant way that people um, uh, save their money, and it's usually cooperatively owned. So um, we have to look at that. But it's not just the banks. Um, whole chunks of the economy uh, are going to be um, foreign-owned uh, once we have independence. Um, energy uh, is a big one. Um, uh, oil and gas is going to be largely um, foreign-owned. So I think it should be an instant rule that any time we issue a new license to develop uh, a new oil field or, 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 or gas field, um, then the bulk of that should be in public ownership. 
and we should do what the Norwegians did from day one, which is to own the energy ourselves. That is possible, but we have to make sure that that's um, part of um, the economic package that we pursue. Um, land, um, huge chunks, chunks of land, as I'm sure you all know, are, would be foreign owned once we moved out of uh, uh, banking are um, retail um, supermarkets. Um, uh, the, uh, the big supermarkets, of course, do the buying of Scottish produce from Scottish farms and Scottish fishermen. And of course, they charge a huge um, a sur a surplus over uh, what they give to the bankers and the fishermen. I think we have to think very carefully about controlling our own um, retail supermarket operation. If we don't that, we can't don't do that, can't control prices. Um, <clears throat> I think uh, also construction. Um, construction is very important because it's, it's a, you know, it's, we need infrastructure, we need housing, we need a lot new housing in order to um, uh, 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 retrofit and uh, uh, improve um, uh, 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 energy use uh, within the uh, uh, housing sector. Fastest way of actually dealing with the um, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the climate crisis uh, is to improve our housing stock. Uh, now, um, most of the big construction companies are UK-based and post independence they would be uh, English companies. Uh, I think that says immediately that we have to exp rebuild, expand um, the construction industry in Scotland. Lots of very good, very efficient small, medium-sized companies in Scotland, construction companies, I think we have to direct a lot of um, the Scottish government contracts to them and build up our own domestic um, construction industry. Um, uh, in engineering, um, uh, if you look at uh, the rest of Europe, countries um, uh, prioritise um, um, local shipbuilding, local rail construction. Um, we've been very poor at doing that in Scotland. Um, we've given a lot of contracts away. Um, uh, we, we should be doing that. Um, we should be um, um, channeling contracts uh, domestically. Of course, that raises issues about European law and international law. Um, you're supposed to be, you know, highly competitive and issue contracts to other people. But, you know, let's just be canny. I mean, you're allowed under most international EU law to designate industries as being strategically important. Um, militarily important. I think that um, shipbuilding is militarily and strategically important, so I think we should keep the contracts here. Um, so if we don't build these kind of approaches into our policy making, uh, starting now even before independence, then we'll end up being um, with a Hollywood that simply posts contracts uh, abroad uh, to other countries. And that brings us, of course, to the whole issue about um, Europe. Um, uh, while we've all been necessarily uh, worrying about um, uh, COVID-19 and the medical emergency, uh, down in London, down at Westminster, they've been happily uh, getting on with their Brexit agenda. And most of the Tory party uh, at Westminster is now composed of people who want a hard Brexit. Um, uh, the new influx of uh, young darlings who came in um, uh, in December, they're all pro Brexiteers because they cleared out um, people uh, who were who were pro EU uh, to get them the seats, um, and, and the old um, the old right wingers like Rhys Mogg, um, they now dominate the Tory party and they want a hard breakfast, Brexit. So what we're going to find out come the end of the year um, is that we're going to walk out of, uh, 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 of of all the trade relationships that we have um, with the EU and we'll, we'll be out on WTO rules. And Scott, that tells me that there is an urgent necessity for Scotland to seize its independence as rapidly as possible. Otherwise, post-December, uh, we'll find ourselves economically in the very worst possible situation. And you know, a, a UK, outside of a trading relationship with the European Union, has only one place to go. It's going to become a satellite of China. Of, of America. Uh, the Americans 
uh, are clearly, uh, 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 Trump is clearly on a, uh, uh, a collision course, a trade war, if not a hot war, with China. Uh, and therefore, a UK on its own is going to have no recourse other than to slip in behind America. And you really see this in the last um, uh, uh, week or so uh, when Johnson has begun to backtrack on his original position of uh, not um, cancelling the contracts with Huawei, uh, the, the, the big Chinese uh, high tech company. But what we're now seeing is pressure from the Americans, pressure from the Tory backbenchers, and we are seeing um, uh, uh, Britain move in line with being simply an economic satellite of America, breaking away from any kind of uh, midway between um, China and the States and becoming simply part of the American economic orbit. And what happens then, of course, is that however um, Johnson tries to dress it up, we'll end up having to open up the NHS um, to the American pharmaceutical companies. They want the drugs contracts and they are actually the American pharmaceutical companies are the dominant part of the U.S. economy, They're the most profitable part of the U.S. economy, even more profitable than the U.S. banks. Um, we're going to see um, our farmers uh, open up to American um, uh, competition. We're going to see the chlorinated chicken uh, in the supermarkets. Um, we are going to see um, uh, uh, American high tech flooding in and taking out our and American takeovers of our, of our industrial base. Um, so, uh, you know, the hard Brexit isn't just about the immediate impact uh, on, 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 on trade, it's about the long-term impact of becoming an American satellite increasing. So all of that seems to me to add up to the fact that we need to get out uh, of, of this UK uh, embrace, poisonous embrace, as fast as possible. Um, we can discuss tactics um, uh, later on if you want. Uh, I, what I'm trying to get across is the urgency of getting out of, of the UK, not just because it would be a good thing for Scotland because we all want it, because if we don't, it will cripple the Scottish economy even worse than it is. Uh, coming out of uh, the lockdown, uh, we're going to see you know um, anything between 15 and 20% of the economy disappear. Scotland is in a, a, a particularly difficult place because the kind of industries uh, that are going to be most hurt uh, in the post-virus um, uh, uh, crisis, economic crisis, uh, are the industries that we have a particular base in. Hospitality, um, tourism, it's, going to be, it's not going to recover for several years. Scotland is a uh, more than so than the UK, has a particular uh, um, uh, uh, implant in, in in tourism and hospitality. The further north you go in Scotland to the Highland and Isles and the rural areas, I mean, um, you, you, you find hospitality and tourism supplying 40% of the jobs. Um, if they don't come back quickly, then Scotland is, put, is going to be seriously economically uh, um, uh, un, under, undermined. Um, uh, we've already noticed this week um, that the Chancellor is not um, paying up on, the, on his um, Barnett formula uh, dividends to Scotland. Uh, I think it's highly likely um, that uh, the, the Chancellor will not um, provide some of the financial backup um, if Scotland's um, uh, income tax returns fall because of uh, the decline in the tourism industry. Uh, so Scotland's deficit, I mean, it's real, it's real deficit as in we rely on our income, own income tax now uh, for a significant amount of Scottish government revenues. If that declines and the Treasury doesn't fill the gap, um, then we have serious short-term problems uh, as well as um, longer-term problems post a hard Brexit. So, I mean, to me, we just have to get radical. We have to get radical in economics. We have to get radical in uh, 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 the uh, independence movement. We cannot afford to wait three or four years hoping that Johnson and Cummings is going to give us uh, a second independence referendum. By that time, the economy could be so battered um, that people begin, and it happens, people lose hope, they begin to become demoralized. They think nothing will change, especially if there's an SNP government. Uh, at some point, they might start to get the blame. So I think if we do not make the 2021 Holyrood election uh, uh, a, a, a line in the sand saying that if we get a majority then, um, that is Scotland voting uh, for its own self-determination, its own independence, and we're going to run the economy the way we damn well want to, and uh, not being beholden to Cummings and Westminster. 
if we don't do that, then sadly we are signing away our birthright in a very dramatic way. It is not, um, ladies and gentlemen, business as usual. That's the point I'm trying to make. It's not business as usual for a whole series of reasons, but particularly, um, um, even if we get independence in a, in a formulaic way, um, um, uh, we will still face a huge economic crisis. We, we need to begin to combine the demand for um, political independence with the demand for economic independence. We need to achieve that um, as soon as possible. And I look forward, therefore, post, um, post uh, the, um, uh, uh, the lockdown to marching with you all in the next, I hope, very big all under one banner demonstration. Thank you. George, that's fantastic. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, that was uh, that, that, that's some strong stuff for a Friday evening, but all of it absolutely hitting home and all of it absolutely resonating with everybody here this evening. Uh, talking both in terms of the from the from the from the local to the inter to the global, uh, and the impact that all of those uh, aspects uh, have the potential of having on uh, on each and every one of us uh, in Scotland uh, in the very near future if we don't act uh, with the same urgency that uh, that you were you were talking about there. Uh, thank you very much indeed. Uh, we have uh, a couple of hundred people uh, on Facebook. Uh, and we've got 30 folks uh, participating here, which is fantastic for the for the hottest and sunniest day, Friday of the year. Uh, uh, and uh, what I'd like to do is we'll start to, if I may, uh, we'll start to look at some of the questions that the people who are here and on Facebook have been sharing with us. Uh, what I thought we would do is, uh, if I can give you uh, two or three questions at a time, uh, that might be an easy way to get some dialogue going. Uh, but what I'll do first, we had the very first question we had was from uh, uh, Jim from Dundee, and I'll just, and he's on Facebook. Uh, so uh, his question is, uh, George, if, if the Tories don't want to grant a vote on independence, should we just then make a declaration of universal independence, UDI? So Andrew, you can be a bunch of questions, or uh, we'll we'll do this one from Facebook. Okay, first, right, right. We'll, then we'll get to the people in the room. Okay, no, nothing like getting to the to, to the heart of the matter. Um, I, I I don't know what's in um, Nicola's mind. Uh, uh, known Nicola for twenty five years. Um, we occasionally have heart to hearts. Um, I was very disappointed that she kept saying there would be. A referendum this year because there was no snowball chance in Hades of there being a referendum this year. Um, I um, suspect that her plan, should she stay um, for 2021, uh, is to um, fight the election on a you know give us a second referendum. Um, Boris, uh, you know Boris and Cummings can face down the last week. They can certainly face down um, a demand for a second India ref. Uh, and I suspect thereafter that Nicola will um, hope that by 2024 or thereabouts, you know, we've, we've worn them down or Boris has gone away uh, and it's some nice kind person that, you know, um, the Labour Party gets elected, ha ha, and, uh, and offers a second in the ref. If you don't think that that's a plausible strategy, as I, and I don't, um, then, you know, we are on our own uh, and we have to decide what we want to do. Uh, and I think if we get a, I think we should fight the 21 uh, Hollywood election on the basis that if we get an absolute majority, um, then that is a mandate for independence. I can't imagine in the last um, 50 years any other country that was seeking independence, uh, winning an election like that, and then saying, well, we'll just fold our arms into you, to you, the uh, colonial masters, let us go. Um, so I do think um, that the next election has to be the line in the sand. If we get, we win. We the only people who can grant Scotland independence are the people of Scotland. And if we ask them to vote for that, and if they vote for that, that is the opening line for in for negotiations and negotiations on how to go. Now, if at that point uh, Cummings and Johnson or whoever their successors might be uh, are still refusing, then we have to play hardball. I don't see the point of going down. You know, sending a our troops down to Westminster, where they can't even get into the chamber now. Where you know, there's, there's an usher at the door saying, we only let enough people, so many people into the chamber of the House of Commons, so you forget your constituents, you can't get in. 
what's the point of being down there doing that? You know, it doesn't produce a thing. If anything, if we're at Westminster, it's to, if they won't grant us independence after a majority of people in Scotland have voted for it next year, then we should bring the House of Commons to a grinding halt. Now, if we have a Scottish government and we need money, then we should just borrow. We should just go about our business and tell the Treasury and tell Sunak uh, to go to hell. Now, you know, it's not, you know, I, I'm not saying let's do UDI when we do it at the backing of the, of the populace. What I'm saying is let's get the backing of the populace and then we are beholden, any Scottish government is beholden to the will, the sovereign will of the Scottish people. They don't go to the conference room and say, actually, here's the will of the Scottish, uh, Scottish people, but, you know, if you don't like it, you won't grant us another referendum, you know, we'll come back next week. It doesn't work that way. Now is the crucial moment. The economy does not allow us to play games in our 10 years because there won't be a Scottish economy. We need to be active now. So would I use the phrase UDI? Well, I'm kind of, you know, having a horn a bit, I know. But what I'm saying is um, the choice for independence is the will of the Scottish, sovereign Scottish people. If they grant us that next year, then the politicians have to draw the appropriate conclusions. Thanks, George. That's fantastic, and you've you've, you've certainly addressed uh, pretty full, fulsomely the the point that uh, that Jim from Dundee on Facebook was starting. Uh, now I see the, the the next question we had was from somebody who's in the room with us here, uh, and actually Dave Sherry was the first questioner. Now Dave actually was going to raise two points, albeit you've pretty fulsomely addressed one of them. But what we'll do, given he said that he had two points to raise, what we'll do is uh, we'll unmute uh, Dave, and he can ask you. Uh, the question that he indicated to us, uh, and uh, then we can we can uh, we can you can you can respond uh, using this video conferencing platform. Dave, can you hear us? Okay. Yeah. Can you hear me? We can. Fantastic to see you. How are you keeping? Fine. Thank you very much. Perfect. I'm glad to be here. Dave, please fire away. Well, I think Boris is not quite as secure as George George says, but that's speculation. We'll leave that. What I wanted to talk about is um we. To, to, to contradict an old hero of mine, Louis Armstrong, we don't have all the time in the world. Even 10 years, uh, capitalism might uh, take us into uh, the uh, fierce terrain of climate change and deeper crisis than even this one, if we allow it that long. So we have to act. I certainly accept what George is saying about the dead end road of a constitutional approach, because um, I don't think the, the, the Westminster are going to concede anything. I think we're going to have to fight, so I agree with him on that. But the second point I wanted to raise, he seemed to be suggest suggesting the Nordic model might be a, a way forward or a beacon for us. I actually think uh, the future's not what it used to be as far as the Nordic model's concerned, because uh, if you look at what's happening there, then neoliberalism, right-wing politics uh, are, are coming to the fore there as well. I think Scottish independence is going to depend on an anti-capitalist struggle ac across the, gl the globe, which with gen you know, the, the Extinction Rebellion, with the fight against what, what's happening at the moment, coming into play. And these are the things we have to mobilise. And in the context of all under one banner, being able to mobilise people like that, I think we can, we, can, we can force the issue. And I think that's the strategy we should be taking. I'd like to know what George thinks about that. Um, should I go ahead, Andrew? Yes, please. Yes, yes. please. Right. No, no, to be absolutely clear, I mean, uh, Dave is perfectly right. I'm, I'm not advocating um, a Nordic social democratic model because that is in decay. What I was saying earlier was that um, a lot of the small industrial countries, the, the, local, uh, the local capitalist uh, uh, establishment, have managed to keep control and ownership of key parts of the economy. So that at least they had a they had they had a buffer against what was going on globally. Uh, and we don't even have that buffer. Um, so I mean, I'm not I'm not, I'm not sure that they use it wisely either. I mean, but it takes for instance a nice example. Swiss bank, Swiss industrial banks, um, the Swiss pharmaceutical companies um, have made Switzerland very rich, and they've made a small middle class in Switzerland very rich because uh, they've been able to control things. I mean, the bulk huge chunk of their workforce, you know, is is, is cheap. Um, imported labour, which they send home for the first time there's any, any kind of local problem in the economy. Um, so I'm not, not at all advocating uh, a, 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 a Nordic model, which worked for a time uh, in the 50s, 60s, 70s, 
um, largely because the Nordics had um, imposed huge um, uh, 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 import controls, uh, and they were able to protect their economy that way. That, that actually was because, and that's what kept ownership local. Um, but it allowed, to a degree, slightly higher wages than were normal because um, uh, they, 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 they could make premium industrial goods and export them. So, no, the, 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 the Nordic model is, is, is fast decaying. And most of the Nordic countries, if you look, there's, you know, 15%, 20% of the electorate are voting for fascists. No, but it's still a key issue that um, the, 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 the smaller countries in Europe, particularly the Nordic countries, have kept control on local ownership of the economy. Now, there's an issue of what they do with it, and I'm not saying that what they did with it was, was for the good of the, of the ordinary people, but I am saying, I'm just making the point, that Scotland doesn't even have that, that post-independence, we will not own very much of our own domestic economy. We own the banks, we own, own most of industry, most of supermarkets, most of construction. You know, so if we, we are, if, if we don't seize popular control, and I agree with Dave, if we don't agree with public control of those assets, um, then independence will actually just be a sham. So I agree with them there. Um, and I mean, and also, I mean, I, I, you know, in, 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 in a post neoliberal world, right, particularly if tr huge trade wars and hot wars open up between the Americans and the Chinese, uh, I think that and with a virus uh, emergency showing the, the, the fragility of global supply chains, I think we have to make a more resilient domestic economy. And you can only do that quickly through public ownership public investment uh, and local democratic control of the industries we're creating. So I don't think there's much of a difference between, between Dave and I on that. Um, and just finally, on the, on, the, on, on, the, on the Boris point he started with, you know, who knows how well Boris will survive, whether Cummings will survive. All, what I'm trying to argue is that what Cummings and Boris represent is a new kind of political force, which is anti-democratic. And you can see it in America with Trump, you can see it with Bolsonaro. And of course, in the political struggles that emerge, you know, individual figures might, might get eliminated, right? I mean, the Tories might panic at the back benches and get rid of coming, right? That doesn't change the fundamental political forces that are at work. If Bolsonaro gets, he's an idiot, you know, a car-carrying idiot, gets eliminated um, in, in Brazil, all that's going to happen is that there's going to be a military coup. Um, if Trump gets defeated, fingers crossed, in November, will he go disappear back to his hotels and golf course? No, his daughter, will, Ivanka, will be running uh, in the next um, uh, election on a populist program. Um, uh, uh, the, 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 the collapse of American democracy will continue, the hauling out of the, of the uh, Republican Party uh, and as captured by, by um, a right-wing semi-fascist will continue. So there's a process going on. And so forget the individual figures. What I'm saying is the process down in, down in, in London is, is moving forward on that populist right-wing agenda. So there's no point in anybody in Scotland thinking we can negotiate with these people. Even if it's not Cummings, even if it's not um, uh, uh, Boris, it will be somebody like them. It will not be Keir Starmer. Absolutely. No, thank you. That's, uh, that, that, that's just, that's great. Thank you. Uh, the the next question was be, was is from somebody in the room, but he's uh, he's asked uh, he's messaged me and asked me if I'll read out the question for him, uh, uh, and it was it, it was Kyle from Dundee. Uh, Kyle says, uh, marching through towns and cities is all well and good, but I think we need to up the stakes. Time for civil civil disobedience on a mass scale. What does George think? Um, I'm. Absolutely in favour of, of mass civil disobedience. Um, uh, I think that might be um, uh, the bridging between the marching and forcing um, uh, where a reluctant Scottish government, perhaps, um, or um, Westminster to accept um, uh, Scottish sovereignty. Now, uh, I'll make this caveat that it's easy to talk about civil disobedience. Um, it has to be very well organized. It will have to be trained. Um, uh, you know, if it goes off half cocked, you, you frighten people. Um, a lot of um, ordinary Scots will think, no, that's too dangerous. You have to bring the people with you, and you have to train for it, and you have to prepare it. You know, it can't be half a dozen people simply running off, you know, doing things in a, in a, in a daft manner. 
Um, and that leads us, therefore, to how we debate within the national movement. Uh, I, I personally think that we have to adopt some of the organizational rules of the Catalans. Um, I think we have to bring together all the disparate parts of the movement, um, all under one banner, um, the Independence Foundation, which is doing a lot of fundraising and uh, supporting individual uh, campaigns, uh, the, the Yes hubs that have sprung up, uh, um, the Yes groups across the land. I think we have to bring all of these groups together and we have to create a structure as the Catalans have to the Catalan National Assembly so that we separate the movement, which is now huge, from um, political parties per se, because there's always a danger of political parties are trying to lead the movement, then they get in a, and they, you know, there's a contradiction between, you know, we don't want to upset the, uh, uh, the government, we don't want to upset the, the, the movement, you kind of get into a stasis. You know, I was very um, unhappy, and I said this too, I was very happy when Nicola aborted the, um, uh, uh, the, the India Ref2 campaign after the 2016 uh, Brexit referendum, she left everybody up the garden path. Um, we were all out over the summer collecting signatures and then those signatures, God knows whatever happened to that camp campaign. I don't know whether they were ever counted. There must be you know, a million signatures sitting in a box somewhere at SNP headquarters. I think we have to separate the movement from the political parties as they do in Catalonia. The movement has to be organized, it has to be democratic, it has to elect its leadership. Of course we involve the political parties, even if we could not uh, do that. Um, but once we have something like the Catalan National Assembly in Scotland, then you open up the prospect, you know, you, you will demonstrate, you will not take no for an answer. And if the worst comes to worst, you can train and mobilize um, hundreds of thousands of people um, for civil disobedience. But it has to be hundreds of thousands of people. It can't be 10 people, you know, on, on a Friday afternoon. Um, it's for, for people to respect civil disobedience and for it to work, you have to actually mobilize large numbers of people. Thanks, George. That's fantastic. Thank you. Uh, first things first, the quick question. Uh, one of the people who's in the room, I can see as a, as a participant, uh, she's called Galaxy Tab S2. Uh, we don't see her name. Uh, she did raise her hand earlier on, uh, and I presume that that was to be asking a question. Uh, I've messaged, messaged her a couple of times directly uh, to see if she would tell me what the question is. Uh, however, I think in the circumstances, I'm prepared to take uh, a calculated punt on this. Uh, and uh, I'll unmute the lady uh, who is, uh, if I can, who's uh, Galaxy S2, and we'll see, we'll see what the question is that she has, if, if we can just get her unmuted. Hold on. Uh, nope, I can't seem to unmute her. She must, have, she, must be, she must be unmuted at the far end. Not to worry, not to worry. We'll move on. Uh, the next question that we have is from... Uh, is on from Ted McDowell on Facebook, uh, and Ted was asking, uh, could we could we fund a legal team to to challenge the media at the moment when it when the problems with the media are so critical? Um, well, I, 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 don't, I don't know who Ted is referring to. Can um, SNP um, fund a legal team? Um, the my, with my experience, I know that the SNP is stuff full of lawyers, um, senior ones. Um, uh, also, if you could spend the amount of money it is spent on um, the um, uh, uh, Growth Commission by hiring external consultants, I'm sure it's got enough money to hire lawyers if he needs them. Um, if we're talking about the movement, uh, then there's a lot, I know there's a lot of you know, move, uh, lawyers within the movement, but I actually think that's quite a good issue to raise. Uh, I'm not against tying up um, uh, the British government uh, in, uh, in, in legal red tape. Uh, we saw that happen through the, uh, the whole um, debate over um, Brexit. Um, and perhaps, you know, Scotland is a land of lawyers. Um, uh, stuff of lawyers who have their own independent legal system and, in, uh, and independent um, uh, uh, legal organisations and who still vote for the union. It tells you a lot about why they vote for the unions to protect their uh, their own little um, um, uh, uh, enclaves. But no, no, I think um, I think uh, I think it's, it's, it's uh, I think we should be thinking about about fighting on all fronts. I think we should be thinking about fighting on on, on legal legal grounds. 
I mean, uh, one that came up this week, as I mentioned earlier, was this uh, the non-compliance with the general rules on on the Barnet formula uh, by the Chancellor. We can I mean let's let's take him to court on that. Absolutely, thank you. And yes, the the points about <laughs> the number of lawyers in the in the jurisdiction and in the SNP is uh, particularly well made. Uh, the next question we have is from somebody in the room, uh, and uh, he's it's uh, Bob Fotheringham. Uh, so we'll unmute Bob. Uh, and we'll uh, we'll take his question. Bob, can you hear me? Yeah, I can. Can you hear me? We can. Please. Yeah. Hi mind? there. Hi there. Hi, uh, George. Uh, yeah, uh, I kind of think you slightly overstated uh, the argument about the kind of fascists at the centre of the uh, of, of the British state. But nevertheless, I think you're on onto a point, uh, and the Cummins affair, I think, is highlighted. Uh, this unprecedented situation where we've got a completely undemocratic, right-wing and racist uh, group of people at the centre of the, of the British state. Uh, and I think, uh, I think the Financial Times described Cummings as the strategic centre of, of the government, which is one of the reasons why I think uh, Johnson doesn't want to stack him. He's the actual person that seems to be running it. So I think you've got a, po a, po a point there. And I think if we are going to force uh, a second referendum, uh, along with all the things that we've talked about in terms of civil disobedience and all the rest of it, I think you're right. And stuff about the ANC uh, and building a sort of democratic forum for the independence movement, I agree with as well. I think we need allies. Uh, the independence movement need allies. We need to look beyond uh, what we're, we're own ranks. Uh, we need to get allies uh, in the climate change movement, uh, and we've got to, a lot to learn from them. I think we need allies in the trade unions. Uh, as well, we need to look towards the, uh, the, the trade unions, and I don't think necessarily the trade unions or the trade unions will come out outrightly in support of independence. But I think they certainly would be on board for the right of the Scottish people to determine its own future and have a second independence referendum. And I think they would certainly be on board for challenging a right-wing uh, Tory, Tory, Tory government. So I think it's, I mean, just to, to, to add to that. So who do you agree with that? And, uh, and, but also, I think, to, to a rider to that, I think it was slightly disappointing that in the Scottish Parliament that uh, when there was an opportunity for the independence movement to, to, to build allies, they voted down uh, progressive motions from Neil Finlay or, on, on, on things like collective bargaining, on, on living wage uh, and, and things like that in the, in the Scottish Parliament. So I think, I mean, we, we, if we're going to move forward, I think we both need to build these allies, but also challenge some of the leadership of the independence movement just now and how they're actually acting, i.e. Sturgeon and the leadership of the SNP. Thanks. So, so uh, 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 Bob, you were you were going to ask a question round about these allies as well, weren't you? Yeah, well, we'll just, just think we, do you think we should, how we could, I can't remember exactly what I wrote. You were, you were going to ask, you were going to ask George, uh, who does George think that these, ally, who, that these allies may, might be? Yeah, okay, that's fine. On you go, Andrew. <laughs> Thanks, Bob. Right, thank you. Okay. Right. Um, Bob raised the question of the unions. Uh, he's absolutely correct. Even though in, in, in the trade unions are much reduced in, in numbers, they still have a very strategic role to play in leading work, uh, the, the entire workforce in uh, the public sector and in, 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 in the various factories. But um, the SNP has something between 12 and 15,000 uh, organized trade unionists on its books. And there is part as a party structure, uh, an official part of the, of the SNP, if people will forgive me just to talk about the SNP to begin with, uh, is that there's a trade union group. Now, the trade union group, Though it meets, though it has a, bu a budget from the party and it's well organized, um, it has always seen itself as a transmission belt from trade unionists to the party leadership. It has never seen itself as a transmission belt from the independence movement to the trade unions. And that, I think, is where we have to see a major change. I think that the trade union group in the SNP, because it's the largest organized group of trade unions in the entire country, anywhere, in anybody, I think it should be organizing, not in a sectarian way, but in a cross-party, uh, in a, a, a cross-party and non-party way, 
to mobilize the whole trade union movement to back independence. Not as a, not, you know, independence equals the SNP, but independence means if we don't get economic independence, then everybody who has a job in this country is in serious danger of wage freezes, second wave of austerity, mass unemployment. So yes, and we have the tools at our disposal, starting in the SNP, to begin to mobilize the workforce. You know, I dare say, actually, I joke about this all the time. I mean, I, I suspect that it's a huge chunk, if not any other word, a majority of the, of the, uh, of the EIS are in the SNP. So it's not like, it's, not like you know, it's going to be a hard job. But the, the trade union group of the SNP should exist to, you know, just to, you know, in, in a gentle fashion prod the SNP leadership about the needs of workers, it should be the transmission belt of a mass movement to get the trade union movement active to get economic freedom uh, for Scotland. And um, um, Bob's quite right also about um, the climate change movement. Um, I think, well, you know, next year when All the One Banner is marching, you know, we shouldn't just be marching, we need to start raising broad slogans bring the whole country together. And one of the reasons we want independence is because if we don't have independence, we can't look after our own beautiful and endangered environment. So I think we, you know, we have to come together with the kids uh, who've shown the way, actually, going back to an earlier discussion uh, about um, marching and about um, uh, civil disobedience. We have to say, well, you know, if the kids are you know, coming out of school, I, I, I was on one of the demonstrations, uh, climate change demonstrations in Edinburgh, and I got on the train to get into Central Edinburgh, and the entire the entire train was full of kids, you know, from East Lothian, who were on strike and their banners, and it was wonderful. It reminded me of 1968. I'm um, So you know, yes, we have to bring the movements together. That's an absolute, uh, you know, and you know, uh, I worry that we, you know, the the, 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 the national leadership of the SNP is a bit too bureaucratic and stateless. Now, can I just say, while I'm on, where's a few hundred of you listening, you know. I think that the leader of the independence movement, who is the leader and convener of the Scottish National Party, she has a, she has a day job running uh, uh, the Scottish government, but her primary job is the elected convener of the SNP, the national government. She should be walking at the head of every all under one banner demonstration. And if she doesn't want to do that, I understand she wants to distance herself, well, she then can't be the leader of the SNP, which is first and foremost the National Movement for Independence. Now I've said that to members of the government, so I'm not, you know, you know, just shouting, you know, from 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 the sidelines. But I actually think, you know, people have to draw conclusions. Right. So, so the real answer to Bob is yes, we need allies. The movement has to. The movement is to win independence to transform the nation. It's not independence per se. So we need allies. Final point. Bob is absolutely right. I, I I'm, I worry about the use of the word fascist. Well, what I mean is there's something fundamental going on at the moment across Western democracies which are atrophying and democratic leaderships are being replaced by authoritarian leaderships. They're not fascist in the 1920s, 30s sense, except on the margins, there's, there's violence in, in Norway, in, in violence in Poland, street violence in Hungary, and by God, street violence in the United States. But it's marginal, it's not all the kind of mass fascism it would smash the trade unions with guns and, and clubs of the 1920s and 30s. But it's starting, we've seen Trump perfectly willing to, to call the, you know, the, the private militias out and back them. So it's teetering, I mean, it's, a, it's an author, a new authoritarian movement, teetering on the edge of violence. It's not fascism in the 20s, 30s sense, I know. We need another, perhaps we need another word for it, but there's a fundamental change where Western democracies are um, eroding which is why we need to have independence in order to protect democracy in Scotland. Um, it's just, don't, uh, all, all I'm really saying is not business as usual. And once you think it's not business as usual, you need to need independence quicker than next week. Fantastic. Thank you, George. Uh, the next question we had was from MR, who's in the room with us. Now, I can see that MR is uh, not sharing video. Uh, I'm not sure if that means that we will be able to unmute them in order that they might ask the question not on video. Uh, we'll give that a quick shot, and if it doesn't, we will move on. Uh, MR, can you hear me? Nope. Okay. 
uh, not to worry. Uh, we'll uh, we'll we'll press on. Uh, oh. <clears throat> Hi, Kim. Kim, are you going to ask a question? Okay. All right, we'll move on. One thing I was going to say, I've got just it just popped up a moment ago, and it crossed, I thought it was worthwhile sharing it with the uh, with the wider group that are here before we move to the next questions. Ian oh. Massey just. Hi, sorry, was that my question? Hi, Kim. Uh, yes, Aberdeen. Yes. Yeah. Um, I, I I just am um, sorry. I have to go back to the question. Um, I was just curious about. Um, I think, sorry, what was the question? Again? All right, we'll, we'll find you two seconds. <laughs> sorry. Um, yeah, at, you know, when I, actually, when I was over in um, Barcelona last year and um, Catalonia, sort of travelling throughout the district, and I, I realised there was quite a lot of flags everywhere and balconies, windows, yeah. not flags so much, but the, in, the international independence symbol um, so it wasn't associated with any political party the majority of the time. And I kind of thought, what yeah, initially I thought, what, what's this kind of, you know, to be sort of um, like the, the, the SNP um, symbol. And uh, it wasn't until I sort of looked it up, I realised, you know, I, I, thought, I thought it was, but I wasn't kind of, you know, entirely um, to start with. Um, and what, what struck me was, it, it, you know, there was very few, you know, there were some Catalonia flags, but everywhere had the symbols um, for like um, the international symbol for independence. And, um, you know, when I look around, you know, Aberdeenshire is probably like, you know, you know um, not exactly sort of pro-independence. Um, but when I look around, I see very, very little, um, you know, here in sort of this area of Scotland. and. Um, um, what was the second part of the question as well? Um, can't even um, yeah, so my, I suppose my, my question is when I speak to people and I've actually been quite um, impressed recently with you know, some people on Facebook saying, oh, Nicola's actually doing an absolutely brilliant job. And these are people that would normally be no voters um, and very, very staunch kind of no voters as well. So you know, actually I've, I've been quite um, pleased the fact that they're, they're actually seeing sort of like Nicholas, you know, do a very confident sort of job. And um, so I just kind of wondered, um, you know, with regards to, um, you know, well, you know, just how we change sort of people's, because these are people that would also say, oh, I'd never vote SNP in my life before. And as I've got no intention of, but you know, how we change people's sort of like attitudes and, and saying, well, it's not, it's not actually SNP. It's it's a whole, you know, it's lots of movements and things, you know, that are, and and that's the difficulty that I'm having with like sort of very close friends and things is how do I sort of change their opinion because they are even my parents are hell bent on like SNP. It's SMP, and I'm not sure about that. And, and that's the difficulty I have, is like persuading people in all under one banner and stuff, I think is a really excellent, um, you know, um, um, you know, platform to kind of, you know, promote things. But anyway, sorry, I said too much. Um, yeah. So. George. <coughs> that's the $64,000 question. How do we persuade people? Yeah, yeah. Sorry, two glasses of <laughs> and it can start speaking there. I've got mine here. Um, <laughs> yeah. uh, I have a general rule of thumb. I think there are a third of people who have always supported independence in one form or another, always will. There's another third who will never. There's a third in the middle. The third in the middle, their heart is with independence but occasionally they get you know confused and the head tells them to go the other way so we've got a people in the middle the way the catalans do it and you mentioned the catalan flags you're right you go to any, most streets 
in Catalonia, you'll see the symbols for independence in the windows, people's windows. Uh, and seeing them in, in Barcelona, actually, because Barcelona is, is all, people think the independence movement in Catalonia is the heartland is in Barcelona, it isn't. It's in, it's in the smaller towns and in the countryside. Barcelona is a big immigrant community. Um, and so it's, it's very mixed. And, it's, that's, and that's where the struggle is, winning people back and forth. But the way they do in Catalonia, um, the, nas the, the national movement, the, 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 the National Congress, is organized, the membership organization is organized on an area and street basis. Um, so you remember the ANC, right? You're, you're on the street committee, and you have all the list of all the people who live in the street, and you have to go and talk to all of them. You know? It's systematic and it's organized. Now, why do we do that? You know, let's just we have a plan, we have it well organized, and we're going to talk, we're going to talk to every single household in Scotland, right? And that has a number of impacts. It's partly, you know, you could deal with some of the some of the lies they get taught. It's also people, that middle third who, you know, they want to be Scottish. They are Scottish, they want to be independent, they want to run things, you know. Um, but they're worried. You know, what they'll ultimately respond to, I think, is not just the intellectual arguments, but the sense that everybody is with it. And that's why the uh, one-to-one -one banner demonstrations have been absolutely wonderful, particularly the demonstrations in small towns. Because it means if you're in some wee town in Scotland, and 40% of Scots live in wee towns, more so than in England, very, new, very, very European that way, when you see 5,000, 10,000 people you know, walking down your street demanding independence, you suddenly realize, actually, I'm not alone. Actually, the folk of my neighbors believe this. So that is how ultimately we do it. It's, a show, it's partly intellectual argument, it's partly showing that we have the power, probably, probably intellectual arguments before a trade union branch to somebody arguing. It's also partly, you know, somebody knocking on our door, street by street, and neighbors having us into tea. In Catalonia, they have you into tea, or well, actually, it's probably the alcohol, but why? Um, but they, you know, the way they do is they don't just knock on doors, they um, come to all the posts, they come around for a drink, and oh, by the way, and they, so that is how I think we have to go about it. And I think I think the last thing, the last point you made was about was about Nicola. I mean, I've known Nicola for over a quarter of a century. I remember when her hair was a different color and she wore jeans. And I, I one famous time I spent, I was on a train, just her and I were on a train journey to a, a party event, and I said, Nicola, you have to smile gently on television because as long as you're glum, people what people watch on TV is your face. Um, so I'm, I'm actually watching her. I mean, she's carried the nation with her because of these brilliant presentations that she's made and people feel she's empathetic, you know, and we are, the movement is empathetic because we are the movement, we are the country, we are the nation. Um, but, um, uh, I, you know, I, we won't win everybody. Um, and I think if we wait for it, we, if, if the plan is we wait to the very last person in Scotland is convinced and we'll wait forever. At some point we have a majority, we say we're going to do it, let's do it. George, thank you. That's that's that that, that was a great question from Kim, uh, and and th those are fantastic points you just you just made. The next uh, question that we have is from Dave Duncan, uh, who's with us, and we'll just um, Dave was going to ask uh, in connection with the Scottish industry and and in particular round about uh, climate mitigation, climate change mitigation and ad adaptation. Uh, Dave, can you hear me? I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Fantastic. Yes. What's your great. question for George, please? Well, um, George mentioned, and it was great to hear it um, said, uh, the um, climate change protests and um, the, the, the effects of planetary change on communities worldwide. Um, my question is, is, not, is really more about economics and, uh, than um, politics, but it's interlinked. Um, that, that Scotland um, has a, a, a growing worldwide reputation for responsible progressive thinking about uh, climate change mitigation and adaptation, setting um, aggressive uh, carbon emissions targets, um, but also in managing our infrastructure because um, our environment is so important to so many of our industries. I mean, we wouldn't have golf without our great environment, we wouldn't have tourism. Um, uh, we wouldn't have whiskey um, without, without a, a friendly environment to all of these things. And as I, uh, in my business, uh, do deal with um, environmental 
activism and uh, thinkers. Uh, Scotland's actually got a leading position that I don't think we make enough of. People around the world do talk about Scotland as a thought leader uh, around um, this area that does engages young people and also old people like us. Um, and I, uh, I, I, I sense that there's an opportunity for Scotland to take more advantage than we do in the One Banner movement, um, the independence movement, and to think forward to post Indy um, about how we can use this and um, prioritise it, promote it in terms of our talking about ourselves as a selling point um, to our own people and to the rest of the world. And I'd be interested to hear George's thoughts about that. Um, yeah. Um, the, right, if, if, if we don't resolve a climate emergency, um, then we're not going to be here. You know, oh, well, some of us will be here by the by the turn of the century, but it, it, it'll be a pretty disastrous kind of world we'll be living in. Um, there'll be mass migration from the, from the center of the planet northwards. I mean, you can see, just see if, if we haven't managed to impose some kind of rational order on society, then there'll be race wars. Um, there'll be uh, I'm seriously worry about the kind of you know uh, combination of, of climate change and trade wars leading to massive hot wars. So we, we, for the first time, you know, the choice is between socialism and barbarism. And that, that's not just a, a, you know, a, a set of words, it's a reality. Um, and I think even waiting, I mean, the Scottish government's plans to decarbonize by 2045, that's too late. You know, if we haven't got, we haven't cracked onto a major decarbonization by 2030, where, you know, the planet is in serious trouble. Um, so I think we're all aware of, 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 of the nature of the emergency. Um, I think for Scotland, um, there are a number of issues. First of all, um, carbon decarbonisation uh, has to confront the whole issue of, of, of North Sea oil and gas. And um, the Scottish government's position is, you know, we have to transition in a, you know, in a, in a, a reasonable fashion. We can't just, you know, there's a constant reference to the, the coal industry in the 80s, how it was just shut down, and, and we can't just shut down uh, North Sea all the way that the, the coal industry was shut down in the 1980s. Let me tell you, the coal industry was shut down in the 1980s by Margaret Thatcher, and nothing to do with economics, and it had nothing to do with the environment, it had everything to do with destroying the National Union mine workers. And they just decided the only way to get rid of them, the, the NUM is just to close the industry. and, and you know, also she closed down most of the British car industry because the car industry was actually just as militant. So I think references to the 1980s and Thatcherism is, is completely misplaced. Um, obviously, we do not wish to close down the, the, the North Sea and Atlantic oil and gas industry and throw lots of people on the scrap heap. But, uh, you know, the engineering talents uh, in the North Sea industry can put to all sorts of other uses. No, we're not, no one can, should be talking about... Um, uh, uh, people going to the, the scrap heap. And anyway, um, decommissioning the North Sea is going to take us at least 50 years. I mean, we, we turn off the, uh, the gas and the oil, but then getting rid of all the infrastructure is going to be, uh, it's literally the seabed is going to take 50 years. So um, uh, uh, I think arguments about, you know, we have to be careful, I mean, uh, um, uh, are misplaced. We have to have a plan in Scotland to close down um, hydrocarbon, uh, hydrocarbons within a decade. If we don't do that, then uh, we are not serious and it will just drift. And that means massive public sector intervention and a massive shift over um, to renewables. And we're sure actually with, with wind power that we could do that uh, and we have to continue with that. One of the problems we have at the moment, of course, is that we, we could very quickly, with a conversion, which I think is eminently possible, we could end up with a surplus of energy production and um, we are not allowed to export it south, as you know at the moment. Um, the way the system works is any cheap energy that Scotland exports south from renewables is taxed um, by those wonderful neoliberals in London in order to subsidise uh, uh, the nuclear power industry. Um, so what we're going to have to do uh, is think about how we can bypass England uh, and send uh, 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 cheap power um, uh, to uh, the continent. 
Uh, but I think that's possible. So there's so much that we could be doing um, that um, if we could transform the economy, and move it away from being um, profit-driven to being use-driven and, and needs-driven, um, then um, uh, we could combine both uh, uh, dealing with the climate change emergency and creating jobs. And everybody knows that. Um, but that brings us back to previous discussion. We need to control our investment flows, which means we need to control our banking system, the state banking system. And some, you know, those of you in the SNP have to kind of knock some heads uh, in the movement to make sure that we can get that grasped uh, within the party and within the, uh, the political leadership, which it's not uh, at the moment. Um, but also, I think um, it takes us on to the question um, uh, uh, Andrew was talking about the debate I was involved with last night uh, amongst the SNP comrades on, online. Um, I think um, I would be happy to see, you know, a, an SNP Green government next year. Uh, and I do appeal to the Green comrades uh, and to the comrades in the SSP. Um, there is no, there, you don't get anywhere, you know, um, you know, being the conscience of the SNP sitting on the outside. It's about power. We need the entire movement in power in Scotland. We need all the political movement uh, in power in a common government if we're going to drive through uh, the green agenda. Thanks, George. That's fantastic. Uh, now, I've just no I've been reminded here that uh, one of the people who's with us in the room has been very asked a question some time ago, uh, and I missed it. So I apologise to Sophie, uh, 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 who's in Glasgow, uh, and sh she's she's here on behalf of Counterfire, uh, and we'll unmute Sophie, and she can ask her question. Uh, uh, which very much follows on from what you were just saying a moment ago. Sophie, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes, we can, Sophie. Good, Good to see you. Okay, Please brilliant. Ask um, yes, so my question was, um, do you have thoughts about the direction of the Scottish left and, and many socialists who vote for SNP in order to gain independence, but don't believe in EU as a force for socialist good, uh, who are against neoliberalism. And as you just talked about there, you you kind of talked about English neoliberalism, but isn't SNP a kind of neoliberalist party? Um, and this crisis has shown that uh, free market economics isn't really working. Um, should we should the SNP SNP be flying the U, EU banner um, as like a driving force? Thank you, Sophie. Um, well, this is a really broad discussion. Um, right, is the SNP neoliberal? I mean, there's a debate in in the movement. Uh, I disagree with my friends in Counterfire and SSP and so on. I think the SNP is a classic social democratic party. The majority of the uh, working class in Scotland vote for it. It has the biggest trade union organization of any political party. It's a party linked to the working class. The national movement as a whole emerged out of the 70s as you know, a, a response uh, post deindustrialization of the Scottish working class. They realized the only way they're going to survive uh, was to have their own state and be independent. It was a return to the old home rule agenda of the working class. So to me, the SNP is a working class social democratic party. Now, is it a, a anti-capitalist party? No, it's not. Is the Labour Party an anti-capitalist party? No, it's not. Social democratic parties, I think, sadly for all of us, have not grasped the fact that we have to abolish capitalism if we're going to survive as a planet and as a species. So, um, um, but I'm in the SNP because it's the mass party of the working class and I fight within it. Um, but, you know, if, if in the end the SNP ended up in the neoliberal camp because they broke with its social democracy, then I think myself and lots of people um, would abandon it. But for the moment, it's where, where we fight. Um, I think um, we have shifted the SNP. Uh, I think um, um, we've managed to break it from its... Um, agenda of cutting taxes, which was always bonkers. Um, I think we, uh, but I think the SNP in the last year or two has become too um, far to the right. I think the fortnight ago, 
are in the second uh, 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 virus debate in, in, in the second COVID bill. Um, when the um, when the party MSPs rejected um, the uh, 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 amendments uh, from the Greens on wind controls, and when they rejected the amendments from Labour on um, um, national wage bargaining, I think that was fundamentally wrong. And I call on every member of the SNP to get that reversed. Um, you know, plague your MSPs. And if, if necessary, there are some MSPs like Richard uh, like Lyle who need to be de de you know, deselected. Um, but, you know, if, if, you, if, if you, the moment that you suggest that the SNP is some right wing um, neoliberal organization, then we're in serious trouble. Um, because it would leave no, no major force, you know, on the, on the left. As it, as it happens, I think that Scotland is a unique position in Europe. If you add up the votes for the SNP, which I think are working class votes, for the Labour Party in Scotland, for the Greens, something like 60% of voters in Scotland, 60, was actually more than two thirds of voters in Scotland, vote to the left. There's not another place in the entirety of Europe where that still happens. We are a left-wing community. We are a socialist community. Um, if only we could crystallize that with independence and a socialist government. Um, uh, uh, so I think for, I mean, I think for the left, the organized left, the, the conscious anti-capitalist left, the problem is we are fragmented. There's some of us in the SNP, there's some of us in the SSP, there's some of us nowhere. Uh, I think there's a genuine need across the party line for the, for the, uh, the genuine anti-capitalist left to begin to organize. And most of the anti-capitalist left is actually pro-independence as well. They've learned that lesson. And for those of you listening tonight who don't count yourself as anti-capitalist, let me tell you that the barrier to independence is capitalism. The barrier to the kind of Scotland you want is capitalism. And we, can, we need to, you know, we, Scots need to, in a democratic way, look after themselves and not be beholden to an international um, uh, capitalist system. So, um, so uh, we're fragmented at the moment, uh, um, Sophie, I know that. And I, I think actually the, you know, speaking of someone who was never in the SSP, who's on, who's on the SNP, who's I'm convener of the, of, the SS, SS, of the SNP socialist group. And I always looked on the SSP as an ally. The, the, what happened there was, was tragic. We need to put the past behind us. The, 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 the anti-capitalist left across Scotland has to cooperate. Doesn't mean to say you have the same party, party car. Let's just start cooperating around things. Let's build the all under one banner marches. Um, let's prepare for um, um, civil dis disobedience that comes that comes to it. Let's move the SNP to the left. Um, let's let's you know the SNP government has to impose rent controls. It's a key fight. It's a key issue within the uh, SNP at the moment. I think we can win that fight. Um, uh, the, the, the movement once you come out of lock up, lock up. You know, the, 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 every, there's everything to play for, and I think it's events like this that show that we you know um, we are more together than we are apart. Fantastic, thank you. I'm I'm watching the time here. There, I was going to say one thing uh, for folks who are in the Zoom uh, in the Zoom chat room. Uh, you may have seen one or two folks posting uh, unsavoury comments down through the chat, and a couple of people uh, attempting to disrupt. Uh, Remy and Hector and Carol and the folks who are co-hosting with me this evening have been doing sterling work in uh, addressing people who are trying to be disruptive, uh, and have removed swiftly anyone who was trying to do that which is the way in which we try and organize these things. Uh, and the folks who were trying to disrupt have not disrupted. Uh, as I say, it's 25 past nine now. I was going to take one more question from people who are in the Zoom chat just now. The next one in the line was uh, it, the users called moradura at gmail.com. And they had a question in connection with negotiation. We'll just we'll unmute them uh, and see if they would li like to ask you a question, George. Let's see if we can do that. There you go. There we are. Good evening. Can you hear me? All right. Sorry, I was just about to leave there. Uh, <laughs> sorry. But no, not at all. I was an early question. <clears throat> I was fascinated by the early part of it, because it focuses on what's central to me. I mean, quite simply, how we get independence, the mechanics of getting it has been not as upfront and focused and central in the wider debate as it should have been. We constantly drift into wider issues, big political issues, big parallel and massive 
one of the things. The mechanics are this. The, the way to get independent ranges from by democratic referendum with the permission of uh, the state we're trying to escape from, which now has a, regi a regime, as George has pointed out, which is as much chance of giving that as the, the Pope converting to be a Seventh-day Adventist uh, along the, the spectrum to, to UDI. Now, central to any negotiating agenda, any politics between states, is the question of, of the negotiating strategy. And I go back to somebody that, that George will re remember, not personally, I hasten to say, and that's the Webbs the married couple who were the huge influence of the socialist movement and the contemporaries of Bertrand Russell and Shaw, et cetera. And they set a, a key dictum, which I've used all my life, which has heavily been involved in negotiations in industry. When you're dealing with somebody, you have a conflict of right or a conflict of interest. You're trying to get a right that you believe you have restored or honored, or you're trying to establish a new right. And within that right, you have to establish a power leverage to permit the negotiation to go ahead. If it's a conflict of right, it's the law. If it's a conflict of interest somewhere along the line, it's the capacity to give or withhold benefit or bluntly to hurt or to prepare to be hurt. Gandhi understood it. Everybody independence movement in history has understood it. The Americans understood it. Until we focus on that, the rest of it, the nature of the economy, the nature of our political system is going to take us nowhere but a complex talking shop, which is fascinating and rewarding in some respects. It's not moving as one iota. If it's time for a quick comment on that from George or anybody, I'd appreciate it. Thank you. I mean, that's the first time I've, I've heard the names of Sydney and Beatrice Webb mentioned. <laughs> okay, uh, I've got the books upstairs. Um, I, I read that as, you know, where do we find the leverage? And I, and I honestly believe the leverage is within ourselves. Um, the, the day we all wake up and decide we're independent, we are. Um, it's not that we need to ask people's permission. We need to get the Scots to free themselves in their brain. And uh, the way that would appear suddenly, you know, um, the Scottish government would start borrowing money and start doing this and that. And there'd be a phone call from Dominic Cummings saying, you can't do that. And somebody would laugh at the other end, you know, the phone and say, you know, stop us. Um, it, it, this is a psychological war. Um, <clears throat> I rather doubt in the end whether um, uh, the rather weakened and uh, uh, a uh, hold out you know, British state has the capacity or the interest to uh, enforce its will on us by arms. Um, so it's a psychological test of, of will. Uh, and that's why I think, um, uh, that's why I think this movement, you know, on the one banner, has been um, the dramatic page turner because we could all sat back in 2016 when, when Nicola turned the campaign off for Indy Ref 2 and just gone to the pub and moan, which, you know, I occasionally do. Um, but instead, you know, it was ordinary folk, you know, who weren't in the political parties, and the crazy all on, under one banner, and went out there and marched. And they went marching, and nobody could have fooled them. They could have made houses of themselves. But, you know, there came a point and looked behind them, there was 100,000 people behind them. There was a point in January when it was pissing of rain, you know, when I thought nobody was going to turn out. And there were tens of thousands of people turned out, was it 40,000? Right. Um, the Scots want independence in their hearts. It, you know, it's just that psychological barrier. So I know, I mean, that might be a, you know, a fancy re reply, but I genuinely believe it. I mean, it's, it's, it's nothing, there's it's nothing mechanical here. It's about, it's about willpower and it's about believing in ourselves. And what we, the movement, do is we tell Scots you can believe in yourself. And I think, I think that allied to the moment we get this economic shock of the virus, people to say, well, for God's sake, right, things are falling apart, nothing's happening in London, let's do it ourselves, and then, the, provided the political leadership is there to say, we can do this. But it's not, can't be done in Parliament, it's not a parliamentary thing, this is about self-activity of Scotland's, Scotland's people. And I think, actually, um, we're going to get into this now, I think the re-election, the re-election 
is 2022, the local elections, because I want to see lots of socialists elected in 2022, and I want to see our town councils turn into real uh, centres of local organisation and community organisation, because if we're going to rebuild Scotland, we do it ourselves. It's not something people will do for us. George, that's fantastic. Thank you. That had a great question as well. Uh, that's just after half past nine now. We've had a, we've had twelve fantastic questions from both people who joined us on Zoom and on Facebook, uh, and I think that uh, an hour of discussion is 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 just fantastic. So I think at that point, we've 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 still got some questions to go, but I think at this point we'll 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 draw a close to the question and answer session uh, with thanks to everybody who who provided questions to everybody who asked questions, uh, and George in particular to you. Uh, for fielding answers and for discussing everything that people were saying in such a constructive and, and helpful and, in, and insightful uh, and uh, definitely putting the red kite amongst the hens uh, style. Uh, we're all extremely grateful to you for your time and your thoughts uh, and your discussion uh, this evening. I'm, I'm absolutely sure that everybody has thoroughly enjoyed uh, everything to this evening. There were a, earlier this evening, there were a couple of points that I made, uh, and I, I just want to repeat them very quickly. Uh, firstly, on, the, on Saturday the 6th of June, uh, there would have been an all under one banner march in Peebles, uh, and we were expecting it to be a great event. Instead, for now, there will be an online Kayleigh on Broadcasting Scotland that evening, so please search for Broadcasting Scotland on YouTube and enjoy the show on the evening of Saturday 6th of June. There will be links to that show in All Under One Banner's Facebook and Twitter social media. All Under One Banner will also continue to host online talks and discussions here on Zoom on the 12th of June, the 26th of June through July and beyond. I particularly think that this kind of meeting here uh, might work very well in the cold, dark and wet winter months, uh, but that's for when it's not warm and sunny outside and that's for the future. All Under One Banner is persevering through the current adversity, and I know that everyone, everybody here is doing their own best too. Uh, we're not going away, and we will continue to campaign for independence. You will see announcements uh, in the press and online during June, and you can be sure that we are working behind the scenes on a pl and plans for a number of things for the months to come. In the meantime, however, George has certainly inspired me talking about socialism against barbarism, uh, self-activation and the need to be rebuilding Scotland uh, from the streets up uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm very grateful to him for, for that this evening and, I, and, I'm, and I'm sure everybody else here feels the same way. Uh, as I say, you'll hear more from All Under One Banner over the coming months as to our plans, uh, but in the meantime, thank you again to George and thank you to everybody who's joined us here, who's listened, who's co-hosted and who's contributed. Thank you very much. I'll bring this Zoom call to an end. Uh, thanks for joining us this evening.